Awesome. Well, uh, hi, Van Heck team, uh, for those of you watching now and also in the future. Um, really excited today to have Prague Khanna as our guest speaker for our internal speaker series. Um, Prague is a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best selling author. He's the founder and managing partner of Future Map, a data and scenario based strategy advisory firm. His newest book, Move The Forces Uprooting Us, came out in 2021. Uh, preceded uh, by, it was preceded by the future's Asian commerce conflict and culture in the 21st century. Uh, he's the author of a trilogy of books in the future of the world uh, order, beginning with the second world. Um, I'm not going to read all these. There's a lot of really good books here with <laughs> uh, titles, got very interesting titles. Um, he was named one of Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century and also featured in Wired Magazine's Smart List, hold a PhD from London School of Economics, uh, and bachelors uh, from Georgetown, and also a young global leader from the World Economic Forum. Um, really excited to have him here. And just the uh, last thing is, you know, the, the book, um, Move, it's very much related to what Van Hack does. We help people move, we help people relocate, work from anywhere. Um, so we couldn't think of a, a better guest speaker to join us today. Uh, Prague, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. Well, thank you, Ilya, and thanks uh, everyone for, for joining today. I'm delighted to be with, with you guys. You're the, the agents and the protagonists of a story, uh, you know, the, the, of this story that I've told, and I talk a lot in the book about the intersection of youth, technology, um, shifting kinds of identity, you know, global identity and people's willingness to be mobile, especially young people. So, uh, you know, I, a part of me, I just want to rush through my kind of initial comments and presentation and kind of get your thoughts and feedback and, and get your kind of uh, view from from the trenches and the front lines of doing what you do, which is something so important to me, which is in many ways shaping the future of human geography. You know, I mean, migration, human migration is the original globalization. You know, when when people say the word globalization today, it's associated with container ships, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, stuff with dishwashers and automobiles, um, or perhaps even with digital uh, you know, the exchange of information and so forth. And, and it is all of those things. But globalization began with our first steps uh, out of Africa and colonizing the continents. And we should never forget that where we go as individuals is a very important pillar of the globalization story and drives so many of the other things that we think of as globalization. So um, let me just share um, a few thoughts. Some of these are data points and maps from the book, uh, but others are just more, more broad and, and conceptual. Um, the first thing that's important in understanding the trends around the future of human geography, uh, which again is much, much broader than migration. You know, human geography is the full study of our demographic composition, our distribution around the world. It's ethnological, ethnographic as well. So there are many aspects of human geography that you have to kind of subdivide and analyze and then, and then put, put Humpty Dumpty back together again to try to get a picture of where we will be in the future. And one of the drivers doesn't initially seem to have a lot to do with geography per se, it's a total number of people in the world. And everyone on this call, all of us, we're living through this very dramatic inflection point in the world population. A moment that honestly never, no one really ever thought would come as recently as the 1990s, um, which is what I call peak humanity. So the world population is literally plateauing very, very quickly. And it has to do with everything from the, uh, from the birth control pill in the 1960s and you know, women's empowerment to urbanization, to the financial crisis of 2008 um, and uh, to the pandemic today, which uh, you've probably been hearing more and more this term baby bust, right? And the baby bust in this pandemic is actually way more severe than even the baby bust of the financial crisis from uh, 12, 13 years ago. So what I foresee happening is that we'll probably reach peak humanity sooner than we thought the total number of people in the world will be less than we thought, um, and the decline will begin sooner than we thought. Um, and all of that would fit into uh, the pattern of, of sort of correcting for the, um, in a way, the overestimations around the world population that we've been making 
for the last 20, 30 years. So don't be surprised if you, you know, you open up the newspaper in the year 2030, 2035, and it says, oops, you know, we reached the maximum number of human beings that will ever be alive and our population is about to crash. So this, uh, you know, why is this important for what you do? Well, you've got countries that are at sub-replacement fertility levels. Their populations are declining rapidly. Without immigration, they would be really crashing in population. Places like Japan, places like America and Canada, uh, much of Europe, much, much of the rich Northern world is in this situation. So there's a particular irony to their immigration restrictions today many of which are being lifted precisely as countries recognize this problem. Literally one by one today, you can look at the world, you can look especially at Western societies and see that one by one, they're waking up to the demographic writing on the wall and saying, oh my God, rather than blocking people, I need to be attracting uh, migrants as quickly as possible because who's gonna pay taxes? Who's gonna live in the homes? Who's gonna pay the rent? Uh, all of that kind of stuff. So I foresee the future really being shifting very drastically from today's xenophobic populism towards the what I call the all out war for young talent. Right. And that is literally the paradigm of the 21st century, an all out war for talent. Some places are already there and actively competing. They're the winners. A lot of places haven't figured it out yet. But once everyone does, or as they do, your business ought to grow and grow and grow. Uh, so the next point is breaking this down a bit by generation. Um, now, what's really, really striking here is that in light of the fertility crash, the baby bust, um, what I call the COVID correction, generation alpha, today's babies and toddlers, will probably be smaller than Gen Z. So there's another business aspect here. Gen Z is the largest generation, the largest cohort of human beings that the that that our species has ever produced, right? You know, just about uh, uh, one point, um, you know, roughly ish, you know, 1.8, 1.9 ish uh, billion generation Z. Um, so where they, you know, they are. They and millennials today are, are the kind of, you know, working age youth population of the world, and they'll be joined eventually by Generation Alpha. But remember, it'll start to get smaller and smaller after that. So where millennials go, where Gen Z goes, where Gen Alpha goes, physically goes, in the context of a declining population matters immensely. And that's the voting with the feet phenomenon, right? I mean, you know, so when you don't have a lot of people coming after you, then you, you it becomes a zero sum game, almost in a way. Um, so here we have it, today's youth represent the majority of the world population. And they always will be the majority of the world population because our kids aren't having kids. And if your kids aren't having kids, it, what it literally means is that the present is also the future because there's no future afterwards demographically. So I know that sounds like sci-fi, but that's literally what's happening. That's what we are doing to ourselves as a species right now. Like I don't deal in sci-fi, I don't write fiction. I'm not making this up. The present is the future. The world population is gonna be declining very soon. And therefore uh, ever the optimist, you know, I wanna focus on young people and understanding their psychology because I believe we should be doing everything literally everything to create a comfortable environment, literally climatologically, as well as politically and socially and economically for today's young people, for the four and a half billion young people of the world. But, you know, just as an aside, why is it that we can't turn this around? I mean, the COP26 summit has just happened. Lots of promises are being made about climate change. Young people don't buy it. You didn't see a lot of young people inside the tent at COP26 they were the protesters outside the tent, right? Uh, they know that it's too little, too late. And, um, you know, a large part of the reason, according to surveys such as this, why young people don't want to have children is because of climate change. And I didn't really see anything at COP26 that convinced me that we should be any less concerned about climate change than we were a day before yesterday. So what are young people's response? You know, again, thinking about the psychology, the sociology of youth, 
all over the world is one of my main motivations to try to understand where they go is literally to look at where they're going. And, um, you know, a lot of uh, Americans or a lot of young people around the world are kind of have been stuck in place. But I, again, I'm positing a different world and I'm looking at all of the ways in which young people move. And I literally do mean physically move. So one of the interesting things that people probably didn't predict is that during the lockdown, young people said, well, to hell with that. I'm not going to be locked down. I don't own a home. I don't have kids. I'm going to get myself a trailer van. And this was, you know, the best selling item of 2020 was the trailer. I'm sure some of you live in a trailer or have a trailer. And, and maybe that didn't used to have the most positive connotation. But today it's awesome because these are some pretty sweet rides. And uh, you can stick, a, you know, Elon Musk Starlink satellite on the roof of one of these things and you can have a pretty luxurious mobile lifestyle. You can drive away from natural disasters. You can drive to where, wherever you want to be. If you don't work in the services sector, if you're not in digital services the way all of you are, uh, but if you require, you know, being physically somewhere, you can just go drive to that somewhere. You're not going to have a mortgage. You're not going to have debt, all of these things. And, I, and what, I, what I admire is that young people to figure this out. Right. I mean, the rate of mobile home ownership is highest among younger people. And again, rather than assume and I mean, you know, uh, most most people of a, you know, a certain age, an older generation, just assume that the American dream should be uh, owning a home and having a mortgage and, you know, uh, and that kind of thing. But I'm very glad that young people don't think that way. I think that's a disastrous mentality. In, a, in an age and a time when you're not guaranteed to have a steady job and income and earn enough money to pay down a debt. And when you don't know whether or not that suburb you're gonna to choose to live in is gonna be a great place to be uh, five, 10, 15 years from now, even, even as a remote worker, there may be many reasons why you don't necessarily wanna stay where you are. So this kind of flexibility to me is the embodiment of a survival instinct even as it may be just a sort of, you know, cheap thrill. Um, and let's remember something now going, tying all of this together, what we've, what I've said so far. What I want to remind everyone is again, sort of like, who's your market? Um, you know, I've seen your website and I see the nationalities of people you represent. It's, it's incredibly global. And I, in the spirit of what I was just saying about attitudes about what young people should do versus what they do do. Let's remember what a normal person is in the world today. And I mean everywhere. I don't mean America or, or China. I mean globally. If you, could, if you could describe the median human being, how would you describe them? Well, it wouldn't be a husband and a wife living in a suburb with two children and a two-income married household. That's not what normal is on the planet Earth for the median person. And so what I took as my point of departure in the, for this book, that the median person is actually young, single, does not have children, does not own a home, lives in a city, and is struggling financially. That is a typical human being in the world today. Let me repeat that, because again, it is the people that you serve as a company, and I applaud you for it. You represent your clients, your, your customers, your members, are the normal people of the world because the vast majority of them are young, they're single, they don't own a home, they don't have children, they live in a city, and they're financially insecure, right? That's who we are. We, we better get used to that because I think we need to, again, reshape our systems around that fact. And I think that's, that's important to, to acknowledge this. So um, let me move on. So again, for me, Youth are not just an object. It's not just people to sell stuff to, right? They are the subject. They determine everything about our future demographically because they're the largest generations in human history. Uh, when you combine them, they're the present and the future. And because there aren't people coming afterwards, as I said, every, every step they take, every place they move, when they go somewhere, they're picking a winner. When they leave somewhere, they're telling you who's a loser in terms of countries. The winners and losers of societies in the 21st century will physically be determined by where young people go, where they're leaving and where they're going. It's as simple as that. I could talk about econometrics with you for hours if you want, 
but we could come up with grand theories and complex variables, you know, to explain the future. But if I had to reduce the entire thesis down to one very plausible, credible proposition, I would reduce it to that one sentence, young people voting with their feet determine the winners and losers. And so you have this war for talent. As I was saying that for me is the operative principle. And the war for talent, this very idea, this very concept has evolved considerably since the term was coined uh, just about you know 20-ish years ago. It used to mean as something as simple as whether New York, like Wall Street or London gets the hotshot banker. That's literally why the term was coined, you know? You know, who's got the Gordon Gecko, right? You know, is it London or New York? That, that, that's what it meant. And it means a, a, a lot has changed, obviously, in the last 20 years. Now, in this century, uh, there are so many more geographies that are interesting than New York or London. Uh, you know, emerging markets have risen. And it's more than just finance in terms of things that talented people do, obviously, uh, because it, it is um, uh, the technology sector has obviously risen and so many other things. And the competition between sectors and across the geographies has now exploded and become totally global. And you have countries competing with other countries. Uh, you know, how many nomad visa schemes were there two years ago? Does anyone have a guess? It was about two right? Like about two countries had these nomad visa programs. Estonia was obviously one of them. Uh, today, you know, at last count, 75 or 80 countries do. But wait a minute, I thought we were all locked down in this pandemic, right? Well, I think when the history is written, we'll see that there was a lot of mobility during the pandemic, right? It was the people getting mobile homes. It was the rate of uh, relocation in the United States as people said, hey, remote work, moving to a suburb, right? Or somewhere that's cheaper or affordable, wherever it may be, moving to another country. Um, and these nomad visa programs where, you know, one by one by one, it adds up to a lot of people, you know, go to Lisbon today, go to Athens today, uh, Bali today, all of these places that uh, Dubai uh, with its golden visa program, all of these places are just, you know, snapping up young people uh, with incentives. So we have an all out global international and intercompany and even intra company war for talent. And what do I mean by intra company? Well, you know, uh, someone might say, well, this team or this division in this country has four day work weeks. So I want to go, you know, work in that work for the same company, but over there, right? And then, of course, within the same company, you will have the tensions about um, whether or not um, uh, whether or not salaries should be adjusted based upon uh, cost of living comparisons, you know, from uh, based upon where you live versus the headquarters. But in a tight labor market, young people can easily say, "Oh, you want you want to terminate my remote work and have me come back to the office." Let's see about that, right? Because they'll just jump ship to another company or to or to uh, or to cloud native uh, companies. So all of these are scenarios that you know we, we the dust has not settled. COVID's not even over. The capacity for remote work uh, was has been present for years, but now it's actual. It's been actualized. And we've only just seen the beginning of that, um, of, the, of, that of how that unfolds. Um, so, you know, the traditional patterns of migration of the last 30 years have been mostly regional. People do move, people do relocate. Uh, more people have crossed borders or crossed borders in 2019 than ever in history. Uh, you know, close to 300 million people live outside of their home country, but we still largely cluster in regions. Uh, whereas in the future, I think that that could change pretty drastically because of labor shortages, because of climate change, and because of countries opening up, uh, you know, seeking more, more migrants to fill, to fill those labor shortages. Now, again, it's all about the young people. So um, looking at particularly working age millennials and where they are, and then who decides the winners and the losers as they vote with their feet, well, just look at how the number of just working age millennials is 1.1 billion in Asia. So what's very important to remember is that basically, if you think about a world with ever fewer people, and most of the world is already Asian people, 
right? 55, you know, ish percent of the world population is, is Asian people. Um, and Asian populations are the ones that are still growing to some degree while other regions are shrinking. Africa is also still growing, but has fewer people. You're in a situation where actually kind of today's Asian youth are the future of the world, um, especially Chinese, Indian, Southeast Asians, and so forth, because they are growing in number while other numbers are shrinking. And they're also particularly keen to escape climate change and corrupt politics and civil wars, or maybe even world wars, that kind of thing. So you can count on a lot more Asians being mobile in the future. Now, right now, many of them may be stuck behind borders, especially given COVID, or their passports don't have a very high degree of, uh, you know, sort of sort of access around the world. But again, that's changing, um, you know, as as countries realize that they need to attract these, uh, these migrants, skilled migrants. So I've noticed this with uh, South Asian populations like Indians, because not only are they already very prominent in the IT industry, uh, but if you think about, if you already look at the data from OECD countries, the rich the kind of top, top tier 30 countries in the world, um, already in those countries, Indians number 1 million more than Chinese. So there's a million more Indian professionals in the labor force of rich countries than there are Chinese, even though China is a bigger country, a richer country, and it has a larger diaspora. The difference there is that India is younger, uh, people have grown up, you know, studying English um, and studying maybe medicine or IT, the stuff that that countries actually need in their labor shortages. And of course, they're willing and able and want to leave their countries, uh, such as India and Pakistan, because of politics or climate change and so forth. So looking at the demographic composition, the educational levels and other sorts of variables around young people, it can be very revealing. One, one other aspect of the war for talent I want to talk about is students. Because the way a country builds loyalty is by bringing people in, of course, when they're young. When, um, and, and the U.S. has been the biggest winner in this uh, competition for young academic talent, you know, for undergrads. Uh, but that edge is eroding, eroding due to a wide range of factors. It's the kind of tarnishing of the American brand due to everything from 9-11 to the financial crisis to Trump to COVID. Um, other countries waking up and saying, hey, I want to get those students and their brains and their tuition dollars. So Canada has really been stepping up and Canada, you know, pound for pound has more foreign students than any country in the world. It's also offering, um, you know, those who enter the country, uh, you know, uh, the sort of the clock starts in your pathway to citizenship. Um, obviously, I know many of you are in Canada or from Canada, so, you, so you're familiar with this. Of course, there's a national consensus that's pro-immigration in Canada, so there's political stability around the issue. Um, so in Europe now, many uh, countries or educational systems are switching the medium of instruction to English um, as a way of attracting um, you know, students who obviously would prefer to learn in English. Um, and, and offering them the so-called blue cards that, that Europe offers. So I think there'll be a lot of dynamism and competition for students as well. So remote workers, right? I mean, all of this adds up to a world in which you have a swirling, you know, global population of young, able-bodied people. Um, and it's everything from low-skilled or semi-skilled construction workers or people in manufacturing to highly skilled migrants, uh, you know, what I call quantum people, you know, people like you, like many of you, who live everywhere and nowhere, you're in multiple places at the same time, uh, you're bouncing around and physically in different countries, and no one even knows or cares where you are. And that's gonna, you know, obviously that, that, that swirl of people and countries seeking to attract them as a critical mass of uh, investors, residents and, and entrepreneurs and so forth, is going to get more intense in a good way. And that's the kind of what I call the jurisdictional arbitrage, right? So it can be people who, not, who don't have to be wealthy. In fact, it could be people particularly who are frugal, who are saying, you know, let's move out of San Francisco and let's go to Costa Rica or whatever the case may be. You know, let's move out of uh, Frankfurt and go to Lisbon. And that's, that's been happening. So you have these different categories in terms of labor relocation. Every category is large and, and growing. And then um, 
the uh, the competition to attract those people is high. So I love this quote from from Simon Cooper. He says, "If you can do your job anywhere, someone anywhere can do your job." And what he's actually saying is that you know be careful uh, about this sense of stability that you may have as a senior professional in a certain company where you say, you know, I'm going to, I'm never coming back to the office. I'm going to live wherever. Yes. You young people feel that way, but remember that you're now competing with, uh, with Indians and Arabs and all, all manner of Asians for every digital job, because companies have said, we're going to hire the best people anywhere. And if they're remote, it doesn't matter where they are. And this really bucks the trend. If you think about it, in America under Trump and in general, also under Biden, the mentality is buy American, hire American and so forth. But suddenly the pandemic has ripped all that up and companies are saying they're going to massively expand their floor space, office space in India in particular, because you can have a software engineer and many other positions serve there at about you know, a third or less than a third of the labor cost. Um, and you know who cares because you're not seeing that person in the office anyway. You're not seeing the person who's in America in the office anyway, uh, in a remote work context. So that's the spirit of Simon Cooper's comment, and it's what keeps I think you know sort of digital uh, nomads on their toes. So where are people going? Well, all of you who've uh, who are in Canada by by choice rather than birth, uh, you know you seem to be picking a winning horse, right? If you look at um, the most recent BCG survey of uh, desirable destinations for professionals. Um, you know, Canada has been climbing the ranks. Um, you know, overall, there's a bit of shuffling going on, but European countries on the whole do remain strong. Look at how Brexit has come down, uh, you know, or how Britain has come down due to Brexit. But, you know, that could definitely change over time because Britain is changing its policies as it sees data like this. And of course, because of the, the, um, the labor shortages that they're experiencing right now. So the final point is about the kind of platforms, you know, why is all of this, you know, destined to continue uh, long after the pandemic is gone? It's because we've been kind of building the physical and digital infrastructure to enable greater mobility for a long time. Uh, physically, of course, it's the transportation networks institutionally, it's the golden visas and, uh, and all of these things. But what I wanted to point to is what are the things that give you a kind of comfort level with the ability to be location independent, right? So you can access online education from anywhere. Your health records are now digital. Think about your vaccine certificate. It's a QR code. Um, so data can be shared and you can access other medical systems and share that data. Everything that's digital around Wi-Fi and so forth for lifestyle issues like co-working, co-living, car sharing, all of that is now kind of, you know, touch of a button in the sense that wherever you go, you can be a member in a car club or a home sharing club and, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, with finance. Uh, so, you know, more and more people have, uh, you know, sort of uh, e-wallets, uh, you know, digital bank accounts, uh, taking payment or, or shifting money around in crypto and this kind of thing. But the ability to access your money anywhere is obviously improved. Um, and then the last point is passports. And I mentioned just now the QR code for your vaccine certification. Well, pretty much all data could be shared in that way or stored on secure blockchains uh, in terms of your travel history, your criminal history, your employment history, your financial statements, uh, all of these things that countries want to know about you. Um, you know, either you provide you know, tedious you know, files of paperwork or all of this can be done online. And if you can do a QR code for health certification online, you can do that for anything. So I actually think that we that the pandemic is actually, even if it's temporarily frozen travel for many people, it will ultimately bring us one step closer towards transcending the passport entirely and having it on an app. I mean, so yes, you'll still have your nationality, but your passport doesn't really need to be a physical floppy document, does it? It really should be an app already. And I think we'll get there a lot faster than we think. So all of these trends will enable ever greater mobility, especially of youth in a world that is engaged in any case in this global war for talent. So just a few thoughts there to, uh, you know, to um, uh, kick off or spark the, the conversation. 
I would um, you know, be delighted to get your feedback and look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Prague. That was uh, incredible. Um, I'm sure people have questions, so let's just ju jump in. Um, if you wanna ask questions in the chat or unmute yourself, team. Um, <clears throat> no, yeah, I actually had a, I had a question. Um, do you think this globalization, do you think it's gonna affect uh, neocolonization positively or negatively? Because you see these best living countries, which are usually the richest or the world powers, they're snatching young talent from the poorest countries, which you know translates to blocking the growth of uh, these underdeveloped countries. Um, but you also see positively, um, you know, global currencies that reduce the influence of most influential currencies. So, do you think that you know affects it negatively, positively? To uh... um, so specifically on currencies, or what was the first part? Oh, yeah, sorry. So basically, do you think globalization affects neocolonization positively or negatively? So neocolonization, you said? Yes. Ah, well, I mean, the way globalization plays out today is on so many levels. You know, again, people crossing borders is globalization. The, the, uh, the backlog to, to get products into American ports and container ships right now is a sign that trade globalization, physical goods is alive and well. Again, digitization is expanding rapidly. Look at our Zoom call right now and the nationalities on it. Financial markets are still integrating. Foreign investment levels are rising and all of these kinds of things. So, you know, not all globalization is, you know, there, is, there are aspects of globalization as perpetrated by some entities that you would say are, you know, neo-colonial or, or perhaps more accurately neo-mercantile. Uh, import substitution practices. A lot of what China does is mercantilism. It's not colonialism. What Europeans did is colonialism. What China is doing is mercantilism. Chinese European colonialism started as mercantilism, then became colonialism. But China is not a colonial, doesn't have a colonial psychology per se. But anyway, um, I think that overall you have a distribution of capabilities. You have more powers in more regions than ever in history. We've never lived at a time in history where you had uh, a, you know, multiple Western and multiple Asian superpowers at the same time or global powers, right? There was a period of course in the early 20th century with China's rise where you had America as the world's most powerful country after World War I, Europe uh, still a, a center of the world uh, you know, with its with it, with many colonies still intact, um, and Japan, of course, rising and aggressive, but Japan didn't last very long as a global as and it wasn't really technically truly global. Um, whereas today, you have the U.S., you have the European Union, you also have a multiple Asian powers: China, Japan, India, and so forth. So we've really never lived in a world of more distributed capability among states. And this answers your question partially because every state is pursuing globalization in its own way. Every rising power wants to be a global player. They want to build out their networks. Right now, Indian you know, uh, uh, companies are out competing uh, for construction projects in Africa with Chinese companies, right? So you know, this competition can be a race to the top because now if I'm country X and I'm trying to decide who's going to do my 5G telecom system, you know, it maybe in the past it was, well, I've got to choose either, um, you know, European company or, or Chinese company like Huawei. Well, now it's you know, the Japanese are there, the Indians are there, everyone is competing. So that can be a race to the top. You can negotiate to get the best quality product for the best price for yourself. So that to me doesn't sound like, you know, colonialism. Again, there are exploitative colonialist aspects of bilateral, you know, trade agreements and, and, and debt and so forth very, very true. But I wouldn't say that that's the way the kind of whole world sort of works right now, which is a good thing. Obviously, it's a good thing. Um, yeah. Uh, Hadolfo, you have your hand up or just unmute yourself and... Yeah, cool. Hi, Parag. Well, thank you very much. I will, uh, it was really interesting. I have a question. So one of the things that we're noticing in Europe, uh, it's the, the growth of the extreme right wing. So basically, they surf the wave of this migration. So they use this to, to gain power. My question is, do you believe that this might bring a new, trou new troubling times to Europe, just like it was recently 70 years ago? 
And my second question, it's in regards to like uh, the system on which we live. So we live in a capitalist over competitive market, which we like constantly take the resources from the earth, like it, it belongs to us. So do you also believe that we need to reset the way that the world is like governed or set in order for us to overcome this? Thank you. Sure. Well, let me take the second question first. I mean, there's a part of the book, you know, towards the end where I talk about moving from sovereignty to stewardship and stewardship is a different mentality. It's about being a custodian of resources um, and contributing to the regeneration of resources rather than merely exploitation because it's our right to do so as so sovereign states to, uh, you know, do anything we want with our habitats. And I think that obviously some countries are evolving in that direction, others aren't. But that's certainly um, you know, a, a, an important trend is thinking in terms of stewardship and international cooperation and lending resources across borders, whether it's for renewable energy or to help countries conserve natural resources and habitats and that kind of thing. So overall, there's a greater volume of this activity that would constitute stewardship than, than, than before. And that's a positive step. Um, in terms of the question about Europe, it's interesting because, you know, to be honest, one can't generalize about Europe just like one can't generalize about the West. You know, we, we've tended to, to see ourselves or Western countries as, you know, suffering from this irreparable, you know, sort of xenophobia and populism. It's not really, that's not really true. I mean, Canada is not like that. Germany is not like that. Um, even America, you know, after Trump is returning to very large scale immigration programs. Now, there are exceptions to every rule and there's challenges and nuances, you know, things like the current situation on the Mexican border, right? Um, you know, so you have instances like that, but you also have, um, you know, the desire or the Trump administration, the, the Biden administration's goal to provide uh, you know, a pathway uh, to citizenship for uh, more than 10 million undocumented migrants. And in Europe, um, you, know, you could look at the refugee crisis right now, the migrant crisis that's being stoked by Russia and Belarus and, uh, and see that European countries now wanna put up more, you know, install more barbed wire fences um, on the one hand. On the other hand, again, you know, Germany, Britain have all changed their immigration policies to be, be more proactively recruiting uh, young people. So I think that we have different policies within the West, uh, generally, even within Europe in particular. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, so, you know, and if you think about the governments that have been the most populist and xenophobic, those aren't exactly places that people want to be, you know. Um, you know, like Hungary, you know, or Poland, you know, nationalist governments that are unfriendly, you know, towards youth interests and values, um, you know, aren't exactly role models. So they also self-correct eventually. You know, Italy is not run by the five-star party, right, uh, anymore. And, you know, Germany's election did not tilt right, it tilted left. Um, so I think that overall, even Europe is learning that it needs to stick to the path of being high migration societies. Now, of course, they have to invest in assimilation. You know, they have to train people in the local language, trade, give them skills, teach them uh, the, uh, you know, teach them how to code, teach them how to be engineers, whatever, or farmers, whatever the gap is in the country, um, in the labor market, it can be filled. Uh, and I think that part of the way to continue or maintain support for immigration um, is that you are not just absorbing people who are listless and unproductive, but you're deploying them into, into the economy for the betterment of your overall, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, societal experience. Um, and I think that's, that's part of the mental shift that's going on right now. Just one thing, but I'm sorry, just to go over it. So I noticed is like in Europe, you mentioned that the, the right wing, it's not government, but they're growing. Like I'm going to give a few examples. So Vox in Spain, they were not, they will, I doubt they will ever be, but they have a lot of space now. Uh, Shega in Portugal, they have 10%, which is unbelievable. Uh, Britain first, you have AFD in Germany. So all these, uh, the right wing in Italy, it never disappeared. So 
what I'm saying is, do you believe that this um, amount of people coming from abroad might lead for this, well, 10 years ago, irrelevant parties to eventually can become government as they are in Hungary, but Hungary and Poland, I believe it's for different reasons. It's just the, the lack of, not lack of education, it's a process that they are ongoing. Uh, but from what you've seen, do you believe that this might bring, uh, this question is like yes or no, so might bring to potential um, right-wing extremis extremism? Well, I think we've had the high point of right-wing extremism for a number of reasons. First of all, the Syrian refugee crisis of 2015-2016 is what helped the AFD party you know, gain visibility, gain national profile, gain some seats uh, you know, in parliament. But guess what? It lost most of them you know, in this last election. So you can't say today in 2021 that the AFD is a factor in German politics, even though Germany continues to be a major immigration magnet, right? So it definitely, definitely, um, you know, is a is a contradictory uh, story or a story that contradicts that 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 view. And remember, again, you know, populism is not good economic policy. So countries eventually self-correct when they realize that they're just inflicting labor shortages on themselves. And again, that's what Britain has done. So Britain, you would say today, has pretty substantially changed its immigration policy uh, since, uh, since, since Brexit. And it's more in the direction of openness. So again, you know, I don't think that there's any one common, you know, so yes, there is a backlash. I'm not denying that there are far right parties and that there'll maybe always be far right parties. You know, we're democracies after all. But even if they win, tell me what they're doing that, you know, first of all, if they win, how long do they last? Right, they tend they tend to not last very long. Populist parties don't last very long because they don't know how to run a country, um, you know. And secondly, what was the material impact on immigration policy? Because the, what I see is that foreign populations in all of our countries keep going up, 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 up. So it doesn't seem to matter if the politician is you know a right wing xenophobic ideologue or whether he's Justin Trudeau. Right. I mean, the fact is that immigration continues more or less, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, immigration continues under the radar. So we should focus a lot more on what people do, what behavior is allowed and where people go um, and what the actual immigration policy is, rather than the rhetoric that politicians are sort of spewing all the time. Uh, thanks all for the great question, uh, Shimena. Oh, hi. Um, thanks. Okay, well, my, my uh, question is a little bit different. Um, I think when you spoke about the whole climate change situation and how young people don't want to, don't want to have kids or, you know, reproduce, it's because um, it will obviously not look good for them and also for the earth, you know? So I know that the earth actually has a way of healing itself. I think like when COVID started, um, a lot of different countries, like obviously the, the, um, the impact that they had on the earth was significant. So um, I don't know, somehow I think that these are like blessings in disguise. I mean, obviously not, but at the same time, like that's the positive thing we could res like rescue from this situation, right? But if you say that the population will decline um, for the future generations because of this um, situation that young people don't want to have kids, um, do you think that this will also help the earth recover from all of the damage it's had um, in the last years? And also, um, if this were true, if this is true, this actually is more of a motivation for <laughs> this generation to not have kids, right? Consciously speaking, um, and yeah. It's, it's a great question, great set of questions that really do, you know, sort of in, interrelate. Um, so, for, so on the one hand, you know, remember I was talking about um, young people buying trailer homes. And I was like, you know, there's a survival mechanism at play, even if you don't realize it. Young people have this sixth sense about survival. 
maybe what you're saying, and I, I support this notion, is that it's kind of happening at a global level, at a civilizational level, where we're, we're you know, for, for a variety of reasons, because we've created the climate change problem. Then the message back to us is, well, climate is a reason why we don't want to have kids because it's making the climate worse. So we slow down. So yes, literally, that is the, the definition of self-correction, right? We're actually engaging in the self-correction. However, you don't want to suddenly have the population drop to zero, right? So, you know, we need to engineer a certain glide path, you know, from the peak humanity that we're reaching, which maybe will be 9 billion people or something, and, you know, gradually have it come down. And a lot of it would just be more female empowerment, right? Um, and obviously, potentially getting, getting a grip on, on climate change. These are things that can help us to have a stable, controlled population descent, or maybe even one day uh, to, to grow the population again, depending on how far it falls. But just right now, thinking about COP26 and the climate crisis and everything, you know, having 9 billion people versus 10 billion people, given how bad climate change has become, is not going to make a huge difference. And, and so, you know, we have to do a lot more than simply gradually reduce the world population in order to make a dent in, in climate change. Because if those people that are alive, you know, are continue to be or on the path of, uh, you know, large scale material consumption, that's not good for the planet, even if it's not 12 or 13 billion people. So we have to bring the population down gradually while also doing all of the things around sustainability uh, at the same time. Awesome, thank you. Oh, thank sorry. You. No, <laughs> same, thank you. Everton, um, yeah. Well, hi, Dr. Perrin, great presentation, thanks. Well, um, do you think that we are in course to develop a um, planetary conscience and try to face the earth as a single, single place and the human being has a single species? Sorry, so the human beings as a single species didn't catch the... For, for example, uh, we have a lot of frontiers and try to identify, for example, another country different than another one, another one, and maybe in the future we try to identify that we are a single species as we are human beings and we try to develop the planetary conscience and identify we are living in one place and the earth is our place and we need to uh, work together to keep this place and something like that. Well, that's in a way part of what I'm trying to get at here in this book. It's not only the generational consciousness, which is very strong, um, but it's also the sustainability consciousness, which is very strong. It's a kind of justice consciousness around the right to mobility, the right to connectivity, um, you know, the, the right to sustainability. And these are actually common youth values. I, for me in this book, these are kind of the three pillars of how young people think. Right to mobility, right to connectivity, right to sustainability. And I think that's actually really, um, you know, sort of, sort of promising as a set of, of ideas and, and, and guiding principles. It's not entirely universal, but things don't become universal overnight. It actually requires hard work. It actually requires building those global constituencies and communities and shaping politics and so on. So we're not going to live in a borderless world, right? You know, actually, right now, the world has more countries and more borders than ever in history. We've never had 200 sovereign states before in history. So we can't pretend there are no borders. It's really about can we transcend those borders? And that's actually, that's mm -hmm. often what happens when you have a lot of borders. No country can be totally self-sufficient. You know, think about Europe lots of relatively small countries. Um, none of them can be totally self-sufficient. And so they have to you know, open up to each other even though they have many borders. 
And that's that process is evolutionary. It's psychology that that has to unfold. It's historical, uh, but you still have borders in Europe, but you also have that level of supranational cooperation. So as regions go through this uh, this process, um, you know, of um, you go through this kind of kind of this this evolutionary set of phases, uh, you do eventually get there. But it's a long process and it's visible, you know, in some places earlier than in other places. No, okay, thank you. Cecilia? Hi, hi guys, hi Parag. Uh, one thing that I always think is that um, uh, you have told that um, now, right now, like about the empowerment of women. And I always think that uh, when you say um, something about like, um, the people going to other countries and this movement, global mobility, I always feel that women are years, like hundreds of, hundreds of years behind men. So every time I hear you saying about, uh, okay, like um, we have now like this many people moving and going to these countries, I always uh, see that um, we don't have as many opportunities as you do. And us here at VanHack, as you can see, we are a whole group of amazing women as well, like we have a lot of women in our um, in our team. But at the same time, I don't see how this is going to change at some point and we're gonna be actually reaching like um, levels that are equal to men. So every time I hear like us talking about, we moved, uh, we have helped, I don't know how many thousands of hackers move and I look at my numbers, I am a recruiter. So I see that I have moved over the past year, 53 Ben hackers and only one of them was a woman. And that makes me feel horrible as a woman myself. We're trying to make it better. We're trying to make it happen. But how do you see that that cut when we're talking about women and men? And although we're half and half in the world, uh, it's absurd how many more uh, men, uh, especially in tech, which is a male dominated industry, are so many years ahead of us. You know, it's a great question. It's very uh, um, eloquently put. And, and it, I, I deal with the gender issue in several different parts of the book because, you know, there are changes afoot, you know, in terms of um, the, the desirability, the role of women as migrants. I mean, yes, in fact, you know, just to compound the challenge of what you were describing, we also have to remember that the majority of people who are forced migrants, right, are women. And I think that's, that's you know, one of the worst, most damning facts of all. But women are also very attractive migrants um, because, um, you know, I'm, the one can generalize, these are specific anecdotes, but they're just come out of, come out of the book, some of the examples I gave. So single Asian women, are have accumulated such a significant amount of wealth that when they go and buy property and they choose you know they're choosing between say sydney and vancouver right and there's a lot of them in that choice they, they're actually very heavily recruited you know they're also not likely i mean i don't want to you know sort of um misspeak or anything but they're probably less likely to be gun-toting violent criminals uh, right. I hope I'm not you know, uh, saying anything out of line here, but I do have a line in the book where I say probably the most desirable migrant in the world by volume is a female Indian IT professional. Because if you think about the sector with huge labor shortages, that is highly productive labor that generates a lot of GDP. And you're the kind of person you want who is going to culturally make an effort to assimilate and not cause trouble, right? And you know, fit in and not not ruffle any feathers. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's basically a, an Indian woman who studied software programming. Uh, you know, surely the least offensive, you know, most accommodating person you can imagine. Then I have another part of the book where I say that you know the Filipino nurse is like the single most in-demand person on earth, right? It's like the Lionel Messi of the healthcare profession is the Filipino nurse because the world, the Philippines can't produce nearly enough nurses to meet the demand 
from China, from Japan, from Singapore, from Hong Kong, from the United Arab Emirates, from Canada, from America, from Germany. Remember, a lot of countries are aging. They need more and more caregivers and they have a massive shortfall. And so everyone says, oh, let's get them from the Philippines. Well, guess what? The Philippines, it doesn't have that many people, right? <laughs> So if you gave me a million dollars right now and said, go start a business, the first thing I would do and the second thing I would do and the third thing I would do would be to open up a nurse training center in India uh, and in Indonesia because they have way more people in the Philippines and therefore they have way more women in the Philippines and they have a young population and those young women want to be trained, they want to be educated, they want to learn nursing or whatever skill and they want to get out. They want to leave their countries. They want to go earn more money. They want to see the world, whatever the case may be. So I think that women have extraordinary opportunities. And, and there are many countries, you know, and perversely, you might say the countries where women have been among the most suppressed, Arab countries, but women are the majority of the population, the majority of the student body in many Arab countries today for a wide variety of pathological reasons in terms of what's happened to young men, you know, pursuing, you know, joining uh, jihadi groups and going off and being in gangs and getting killed and, and or needing their, their families, needing them to work. And so as a result, you have more women than men being educated in many countries uh, around the world. And that creates even more opportunities for women to, uh, to, to, to travel and be a kind of, you know, sought after migrants. So, I really, really hope that those few examples, they're not just micro anecdotes. I'm trying to describe millions and millions and millions and millions of women. And that, that adds up to a pretty important change in the way in which we perceive the role of women in migration. So to me, it's extremely important. And let me just add one more thing for those of you who have kids or whether or not you do, I mean, your parents obviously did have kids and uh, your siblings and cousins uh, you know, do. You know, one of the, the one of the key terms during this pandemic was motherhood penalty, right? So if you're in the U.S., Canada, U.K., you know, um, motherhood penalty is meant, and I, I don't, you know, people have said this, and I don't want to, I'll put it in quotes, but that women's rights have been set back decades, right? That's what people have been saying. That's what experts have been saying as a result of this pandemic. Uh, you know, and now let me just focus on America, which I know better. Um, but if that's true, if, you know, countless women, you know, had to drop out of the workforce and, and step away from the career ladder or get, abandon their professional ambitions entirely because of the pandemic, because they needed to be home and they couldn't juggle remote work and homeschooling and, and, and uh, you know, caring, taking care of the house and potentially, you know, being divorced and dealing with your parents, and it was just too much. If that's what if that 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 is exactly what has happened, and if it's happened to the degree that is being reported, and if it's irreversible uh, because of a wide variety of, of of reasons, that's awful. That's awful. And what makes it most awful is that it's entirely preventable. It's enti entirely preventable by importing more women, right? Because you know I can find you. I can look across the Mexican border. And I can see millions and millions of women who are willing to sacrifice their family unity to come and work in your house, to take care of your children, to, to, to clean for you and run your errands so that you can remain on your professional ladder. And we, you know, as Americans or Europeans, you know, consider ourselves the most evolved, civilized, wealthy, advanced society in the world. But what we're doing to working women right now is quite uncivilized. It's downright backwards. And I live right now in a country, Singapore, um, which doesn't have this problem, you know, because we have Filipino and uh, Indian and, and Indonesian nurses and caregivers and nannies and cooks and maids, um, you know, that get paid a lot more here than they would get paid at home. They also get to travel home regularly if they're, um, you know, or, you know, sort of it's, it's their right to do so. And it's all part of the remittance economy. And, um, you know, so here I am in a, in, a, in a country that is populated by Chinese and Indian people, and no professional woman has had to quit their job during this pandemic, not, not one that I know of. And so I say that as, you know, citizens of Western countries, 
we should be downright embarrassed. We should be absolutely ashamed of ourselves that elsewhere in the world, they get immigration policy right. They have the right number of men and women to work in the economy and services jobs in the, in the, in the labor kind of intensive industries so that we can climb the professional ladders. So, you know, if you have a, a sister or an aunt, uncle, cousin, whomever, a woman who's had to drop out of the labor force uh, because of the pandemic, because they didn't have help, that basic help that billions of men and women are willing to come to your country and provide, you know, and you haven't let them, you've done a great disservice to your people, right? And other countries have not been so selfish and foolish. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn and a lot of introspection to do on this issue. Rog, this was fantastic. Um, excuse me. Thank you so much. Uh, this hour flew by. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone else has, has a lot of questions as well. Um, but yeah, we'd uh, love to, to stay in touch. And I, I did have one question about how we can we can kind of position that hack uh, that maybe we can get to another time. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. I think you can see in the chat, everyone's uh, very grateful. Thank you so much. No, look, I, I appreciate so much what you're doing. You're you're really the vanguard. Um, you know, I, I write precisely about you and what you do in this. So I've got a lot to learn from you guys as well. So please, uh, please keep in touch. You know, for me, it's not just a book. It's a it's a mission, right? You know, I really do want to promote uh, an orderly and beneficial recirculation of the world's young population. So I think of you really as heroes in that in that story. Uh, so let's uh, let's stay in touch and let's remain allies. Yeah, definitely happy to share, you know, data, trends, all those things that we're seeing uh, as well. Please do. Great. Okay, well, um, I'm going to stop the recording.